For all of you who believe that there is a government conspiracy against the American people, let me tell you how stupid our government is. See, a conspiracy, if you got a big conspiracy, it requires huge amounts of resources, huge amounts of intelligent people who are all working together on the same side to do some sort of diabolical act, okay? And I'm here to tell you, if anybody's ever been in the military, you know that there's no such thing as military intelligence. Huh? Yeah, oxymoron. So, we have this trailer we're dragging behind us, and I just got a trailer plate put on it before we left. Just did. And I put two bolts in it, on the little holder on the back of the trailer, had, and I had to get my own bolts, didn't have bolts with it. I put two bolts on there, and I put two nuts on each bolt, Brother George. You know, the first nut to hold the bolt on, the second nut to hold the first nut on, okay? So us nuts don't fall apart, right? So I got two nuts apiece holding that, that plate on. And um, so... We decided to go to Los Angeles. We drove to Los Angeles and the same day decided to leave Los Angeles. It was that bad. Traffic was horrible. In and out. Couldn't get anywhere. I, did, I didn't. I left. Yeah, I... I I, I, took, I put up with it for a whole day, getting in and out. It was bad leaving as it was getting in. Because we got there, and I've got an app that shows you where all the RV parks are where in your area. It shows you all the RV parks all throughout the country. We called 15 RV parks in the Los Angeles area. All of them booked up. Every one of them booked up. No place to park this RV. And in Los Angeles, usually like at Walmart, you see RVs parked at Walmart and stuff like that. In the bigger cities now, they don't let you do that. Los Angeles, Las Vegas, New York, big cities like that, they don't let you do that anymore. You can't do it. Out in the, out in the country, you know, you get away from the big cities, they don't mind you doing it. Like we stayed in Joplin the first night. We stayed in that Joplin place. But anyway... Um, so I'm calling RV parks. We can't find any place to stay. So we said, let's get out of town. Let's drive, let's drive back east and get out of town. So we drive to Barstow. We make it to Barstow, California, which is sort of right on the edge of California, um, between Arizona, Nevada, and California. It's right in that area. And spent the night in a truck stop. So I didn't notice, and a couple days later, about three days later, we were in Gallup, New Mexico, and at an RV park, and I got to checking around the RV, and I noticed the plate was missing. And I thought, you know, sometimes you hit a low spot coming out of a gas station or going across a road or something like that, you hit a low spot, and I thought it may have ripped it off. But I looked, and the plate holder is perfectly intact. It wasn't bent or nothing. And I went, surely all four of them nuts didn't loosen themselves and just come off. Somebody had to have stolen that plate. And my guess was it was in, that, in Barstow, California, at that truck stop while we were parked there. Truck stops are not really the safest place to RV park, okay? Um, some of the truckers are not good people, okay? And it just, you know, in the middle of the night, it attracts people that aren't all that good. So it wasn't until a few days later that I noticed it missing. We're in Gallup, New Mexico. So I texted my sister and I said, I need the number of Jefferson County 
Sheriff's Department because I got to report a stolen tag. Because I don't want to get pulled over and them say, you don't have a license plate for this trailer. We're going to write you a ticket. I don't want that. So I want to report it stolen. So the guy at the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department says, where are you? I said, well, I'm in Gallup, New Mexico, but I think it was stolen in Barstow, California. He said, well, you need to call California. I said, but it's licensed in Jefferson County, Missouri. He said, doesn't matter. You need to report it where it was stolen. In fact, you need to take it. You need to take it to the local police department. I said, I'm not there. So I get off phone with him and I call California Highway Patrol. Remember Chips, Ponch and John? I'm talking to Ponch and John. So I call California Highway Patrol and I tell them that I've, I'm in Gallup, New Mexico. I got a plate in Jefferson County, Missouri, but I think it was stolen in Barstow, California. And she said, well, we can't handle that here. You need to get in touch with Barstow, California. So I called Barstow, California Police Department. And I said, hi. I said, I got a license plate in Missouri. I'm in Gallup, New Mexico. I have every reason to believe it was stolen in Barstow, California, your city, at a truck stop. And I need to report it stolen. And she said, where are you? I said, I'm in Gallup, New Mexico. She said, well, you need to report that where you are in Gallup, New Mexico. So I hung up, called Gallup, New Mexico. I was in Gallup, New Mexico. I would have gone by the police station. Gallup, New Mexico. And I said, hi, I got a license plate in Missouri. I was in California. I stopped in Barstow. I think it was stolen there. I didn't notice it until about three days later. I'm in Gallup now, and I need to report this stolen plate to somebody. And she said, where was it stolen? I said, Barstow, California. She said, you need to call Barstow, California. <laughs> so I'd sent all that to my sister. She found a very good Jefferson County deputy who took down my stolen plate information and gave me a report number. I said, all I'm trying to do is keep from getting a ticket. He said, I got it. I got it. No problem. So I finally got a stolen plate information, you know, number, report number. But if you think that the government is working against us to destroy us, they're not. They can't even get along on a license plate. Much less anything else. Doesn't make sense. Revelation chapter 3 verse 10. Revelation chapter 3 verse 10. Who in here has ever been persecuted? Raise your hand. Physically or spiritually? And I will tell you. I will tell you, in my opinion, spiritual persecution is far worse than physical persecution. It's far worse. And this is kind of where I'm going to be going with this. Revelation 3.10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly... Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Now watch this. He's telling you what to do when you're being tried, tempted, persecuted, beat on, whatever. To try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. What you have is this. This is what you have. You hold on to this book. 
like it's your anchor, like it's your life vest, like it's your scuba gear if you find yourself underwater, like it's your parachute if you find yourself falling. You hold on to this book and faith and trust in this book. It will save, number one, it will save your physical life for as long as God has pl you planned to stay here. Number two, it will save and preserve and keep your soul for eternity. Be not afraid of the one who can kill the body. Be afraid of the one who killeth both body and soul, Jesus said. That's who you're to be afraid of. But we're all tried. We're all going to go through a fiery trial. I started this. I, I don't remember exactly where, but let's go to 1 Peter 1. I'll read through this sort of very quickly, then we'll move on. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. A lively hope. That means that we have hope that what God said he'll do, He'll do. We have hope in that. I want you to think of the idea of a woman who is travailing and giving and is in the process of birth. During that travailing, those travailing hours, there's nothing fun about it. Trust me. I tried to kid around with my wife the first time she was giving birth. I learned Never to do that ever again. Because there's nothing funny to them about this. And uh, if she says, don't touch me, don't touch her. That's what I found out. Okay? But there's nothing funny about going through trials and persecutions and tribulations. But you can have hope. If you will trust in hope and believe in hope, and hope is not wishing. Like we say, boy, I sure hope it rains one more time before harvest comes in. We passed a lot of cornfields and a lot of things that look like they're getting ready for harvest. Saw brand new, we passed a brand new combine going down the road. I'm going, somebody's fixing to get a new combine just in time for corn or soybean harvest or whatever it was. Somebody's getting a brand new one. But hope is that well-grounded knowing that if God said he'll do something, he'll do it. It is an absolute. And the only thing that can keep you from believing that God will do it is the knowledge of your own sin. I know how it works. You get to thinking, I've done too many things bad. I've done, I've done too many things wrong. I've, I've made mistakes. I, this, 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 this thing that I'm reading here does not apply to me because it talks about those who are righteous. Well, who's the only righteous person that we know? Jesus Christ. But the Bible calls him our righteousness. So if you are in Christ and Christ covers you, then you bear not the reproach or the condemnation of your sin, but you bear the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And once you are in Christ, you are now accounted worthy of all of the blessings that God promised to the righteous man all throughout the... Uh, let me give you an example. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scorn, scornful. I've done all three of those. 
I've done all three of those. So that, that passage does not apply to me. The only person it applies to is Christ. Because his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. I meditate in the law of the Lord, but I don't do it day and night. So it belongs to Christ. The only way that I can have access to those benefits is that if I am in Christ and Christ is in me, then I have access to those benefits. Somebody say amen. So those promises do apply to you. So he says here, um, uh, let's see here, uh, where were we? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. Lively hope. That means you believe what God said and you're basing your life on it. You're putting your life on this thing. Let me, let me stop here again and tell a, a, a Las Vegas story that was told to us. I, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but I want to mention it in this context. We've put all of our hope in Jesus Christ. We put, I mean, I do not believe that you should try to learn more than one religion just in case one of them's wrong. You might have one of them right. In other words, I do not recommend you trying to be a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, and a Buddhist all at the same time. Because they're contradictory to one another. And you vote, you can only pick one. And God says, I'm a jealous God. And if you've decided that you're going to pick these other three along with me, that doesn't count. I'm going to kick you out. You pick Bible Christianity, you pick a trust in Jesus, and you stick with it. In other words, I'm putting all of my eggs in the basket of the gospel of Jesus Christ. My entire soul, I am, I'm counting on God to do this thing for me. We were told that a, a man went to Vegas, and apparently he got on a winning streak, and... But then he started losing and he, you know, these casinos convince you that you can get back on a winning streak again and win. So at these casinos in Vegas, they have places where you can sign over the title to your car. And then they'll loan you money against your car. Of course, if you lose that money and cannot pay that money back to them, then you lost your car. You signed it over to them. So he signed over the title to the car that he drove to the casino. After losing that money, somehow, someway, he signed over the title to the car that he owned that was at home. And he lost that money. Then he signed over the title to his house, his land, the place that he lived. He had, he, he had emptied out all of his bank accounts and he lost his house, his land, his bank accounts, his vehicles. He lost everything in one night. And he walks up to the top, the parking garage, and he steps off the edge, kills himself. He had put his hope in a paradise, not paradise, a crap game. He put his hope in a roulette wheel. By the way, did you know that in a true roulette wheel, if you add up all the numbers that are on a roulette wheel, you know what number you get? 666. It's called the Wheel of Fortune. As not, um, that is a true, that is a true statement. That shows you how hellish and how devilish that stuff is. That shows you what, what devils are associated with that. That man put his, all his hope in his dice throwing and lost everything and then lost his soul that night. 
Lost everything. We have a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, the trial of your faith is more precious than all the money that there is in Las Vegas, all the casinos in Missouri, all of those Indian casinos that I saw. By the way, you drive through New Mexico and Arizona and you're going to see an Indian casino about every 10 miles. That is their number one industry. Because they're not under the laws in those Indian reservations. They're not under the laws of the state of Arizona or the state of New Mexico or state of this or state of that. that that's their land. And they have a right to do whatever they want to on it. And they all build casinos on them. And they're nice looking places, real nice resorts. And they're just, they're just there to take all your money away from you. Still, yeah, still scalping. Yeah, exactly. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having, and I do believe, I absolutely believe that there is a fiery trial coming to this earth. And as I go through this, I may explain what I mean by that. Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, Yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. As we were going through the Tulsa area, you can still see the building that Oral Roberts built. Oral Roberts said he saw Jesus one night standing 300 feet tall. He saw a 300 foot tall Jesus in a vision one night, and this Jesus told him to build a hospital next to the campus of Oral Roberts University. When he applied to the city of Tulsa to build this hospital, they, they told him, we don't need a hospital in that area. We, we just don't need it. They said, God told me to build it. So they finally, I don't know whatever, I don't know who he bribed or whatever pressure he laid on the city council. But they finally let him build his hospital. It operated as a hospital for, I don't know, five, seven years, something like that. Went broke. Because they didn't need another hospital. Sold it. There's, they sold the space off as office space now. See, that wasn't really a... A promise from Jesus, was it? That was a lie, wasn't it? That was a lie. But that was a way to get enough money out of his people to build this big hospital. Because he was gonna, it was going to be this big healing center where everybody that went into that hospital got healed. Well, excuse me, Oral. There's other hospitals that you can go into. They'll let you walk in just about anybody's room and you, and you can heal all the people you want and Send them out of that hospital whole again, if that's really what you can do. But he couldn't do that anyway. Amen. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, the Bible says. Now turn to, turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. And when my eyes fixed on this, and I read it, I just, God just dealt with me about it. Mike. When they, when they tell you that the rapture should have happened already and it didn't, don't think that that's because I broke my promise. Don't think that that's a strange thing. Beloved, 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning, and he says it again, fiery trial. Back in chapter 1, he said, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. He says it in 1 Peter 1, and he says it again in 1 Peter 4. That the trial that's coming is a trial by fire. So he says, 
Uh, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. And he said, if you suffer that way, you're not, don't, don't come begging to the church saying, oh, I'm being persecuted for my faith. No, you're not. God knows that you're being chastened because of your sin. And that's different. I mean, it brings about the same results. It corrects you. But you're wanting everybody to feel sorry for you for being chastised or being your bad things happening to you when the truth of it is you had it coming to yourself. You, you deserved it. God did that to you for a reason, to correct you. So he said, um, verse 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian... Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. How was it that Peter and John, when they were beaten by the Sanhedrin, when they walked out of that meeting after having been beaten, what was their attitude when they came out of that meeting? They rejoiced inasmuch as that they had been found worthy to receive persecution for the cause of Jesus Christ. They rejoiced in the beating that they got because they knew that they had preached the gospel, they had healed this man, they knew they had done right, and they knew the devil didn't like it, and the devil beat on them, and they walked out of there rejoicing as a result of it. And see, that's the difference. When you're chastened for things you do wrong, you have a little bit different attitude on the other side of it. You're humbled. You've been brought down. You're kind of thanking God for his mercy, for correcting you, for loving you. God, why do you put up with me? But when you are persecuted for righteousness sake, you don't have that weeping humility with you. You have a rejoicing with you that God found that you were worthy to receive persecution for the cause of Jesus Christ. You don't see Stephen as the stones are bashing his brains in. You don't see Stephen crying, saying, what did I do to deserve this? You know what he did? He did the same thing Jesus did. Father, hold not this sin against them. He forgave those who were throwing stones at him to kill him. And at the end, he gets to see heaven open and the throne of God and Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. He gets to see that while he's being beaten with stones down here on this earth. And you know what I think? I don't think just Stephen is the only Christian that God would ever do that for. Because I've been with saints who were dying, who could literally feel the presence of angels surrounding them. One man that I knew as a boy, he told us, my mom told us this, the night that he was dying, he said, do you hear that? What? That is the prettiest singing I've ever heard in my life. Don't you hear that singing? I've never heard anything so beautiful in all my life. And then he died. He was hearing angels around him singing the praises of God before he left this world to give him assurance that he's going to be with Jesus for all of eternity. He had just gotten saved. Just gotten saved. Because he found out he had leukemia and he was going to die from it. 
but God saved him. Amen? And that's how, it, that's how it is, folks. That's how it is. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. For if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be, scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. You can count on it. That it, if, if nothing else, men are going to revile you. But worse than that, the devils of hell are going to persecute you. They're going to go after you. And you're going to, God's going to put a smile on your face. And you're going to know that you're fixing to go be with Jesus. Somebody say amen. That's how it is with God's people. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. The bell rang. Father, bless your word. We thank you for it. Father, teach us the, 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 the days that are coming. Father, I want to be like the ones that I've ministered to who were close to death, who knew, knew in their heart that death was just minutes away. They couldn't articulate it. They couldn't say it. But they knew it. And they had a smile on their face. God, when it's my time to die, that's how I want it to be. I don't want to be afraid. I want to be happy. I want to be full of joy. I want to hear angels sing. Welcoming me into heaven. That's what I want. Bless this word today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all the God's people said.